Well, I'm excited to be here. I, I'm excited Christy asked me to be part of this. I hope what I have to share, it will be useful to you. And uh, I hope that my journey through life inspire you to do better, pursue your dreams and passion and overcome any barriers that you could be having. So I want to tell you a little bit about myself. This is me. So this, today, on today, please, I own Superior Translation. Okay, so my business, um, we do translation interpretations. And so, um, and right now I have probably the, the biggest organizations in the state that I do work for them. But I want to tell you how I got to that point, okay? And also, I have a music studio. And I also used to own a retail business, but I just barely sold it. And I had it for like 12 years. And uh, I'm still working on it because they kind of rehired me to keep running it. So, and um, this is my education. I do have a master in education instructional design. Um, I also have a bachelor of science and human services management and family and children um, counseling. And um, I also went to the University of Utah. I took all the Spanish classes and tests and all that because like, I thought I was going to be a Spanish major. And you'll notice I kind of bounced around things. So anyway, I, I was a student here. This is how it all started for me a little bit. So I do have an associate of science. And also um, I have a, a degree in, in fine arts and I got that in, in, my, in Argentina and I'll tell you a little bit about that. And so anyway, that's how I have a music studio. <laughs> so anyway, beside that, I had a lot of training certifications. And you'll see, I'm not going to mention all of that, but I want you to see that I have a few of them. And then um, I just remember them a little bit. Because I'll all that. So Superior Translation, very proud of that. This is my music studio. I have a lot of students, all ages. And I want to tell you, I'm very proud of it. But half of my students have disabilities. But if you come to a concert, you can't tell which ones they are. And the only reason why I have been able to do a lot of that is because I have some degrees. I, I did through some training. And so I created my own curriculum how to help kids to learn music that have disability. So I have kids that with hearing um, is, um yeah, they can't hear. I have kids with autism. I had kids with uh, all types of things. But anyway, but also I was in the music and applied art, so I like painting. And right now I'm working on uh, a children's book, and that's my the cover of the book. I'm working on it. I'm doing all the artwork and writing the music for it, and I wrote the stories. So anyway, hopefully that's my goal for these years. So to have it published. So I'm a little bit everywhere, and this is my retail business. So we purify water, <laughs> and we are in West Jordan. So I became really good uh, at knowing about alkaline water, ozone water, purified water, how to run systems and all that stuff, working with employees and going up and down with the economy, the pandemic, and all that stuff. So anyway, so I have quite a bit of experience there. So let me tell you a little bit about me. So I was born in Argentina. Do you know where Argentina is? South America? <laughs> yes, good. Some people have said, oh, somewhere back east. And I go, what about south? <laughs> down south. So anyway, um, Argentina is a beautiful country. We have all the weathers, mountains, snow, and we have jungle. But I was born in Entre Rios. Entre Rios in Spanish means between rivers, okay? In that little river there. And it's, it's just next to the Uruguay. And a little bit to the north is Brazil. So um, it's kind of jungle. Very green, a lot of green. 
rivers. And here I got a little bit mad. I was born in Paraná, right there. Paraná means waters coming down, which is the river Paraná. It's one of the largest rivers in America. And it started in Brazil and it dies all the way down in the Rio de la Plata. But there's rivers and all over. So that's why it's between rivers, two humongous rivers. To tell the truth, crossing these rivers takes you almost an hour just to cross them. Because there are tons of little islands in between, you have to cross them there, but they're humongous rivers. So anyway, so that's where I'm from. And we speak Castilian, it's Spanish, but it's a little bit different. And we're very proud of it. <laughs> to say we speak Castilian, okay? That's an art. So there's me in one of the trips by the river. I did a lot of things. This is my town, that's Paraná, where I grew up. I just wanted to show you a little bit of pictures to show you. Sometimes you think South America, and sometimes you think a lot of poverty uh, and things like that. And it's not like that. You do have things like you do here in the United States. Beautiful areas where there's, you know, and poor areas, you know, but it's beautiful. I grew up in a very beautiful town, very Victorian. Um, it has a lot of, um, what's gonna say, a lot of the buildings look like you're in Europe, like in Italy, in Italy. okay? But that's to show you, show you a little bit where it came from. And this is my high school time, and I want you to notice something. This is me. Look at what I'm wearing. <laughs> it's all style today. I just took my granddaughter to buy her some bell bottoms, and I'm like, oh my god. Okay, high school time, and there's the time. The reason why I put these pictures because this was the year I immigrated to um, United States. Okay. So why leaving home? I had a beautiful family. I was school and I was going to school and I live in a good place and all that stuff. But I come from the era is called Desaparecidos. I want you to, if you have a phone, when you get a minute, go and write those words and put Argentina Desaparecidos, okay? That word, and it'll tell you why. So what happened is, Argentina is a republic, okay? And by the way, we don't have state, we have province, okay? So um, there, there in Buenos Aires, we have a peronismo. If you, I heard a little bit of stories out of there. So there's the peronismo, and the peronismo had allowed the communism, the socialism to come in there. So the military forces started to think, hey, we're gonna lose the, the organization of the country, the communists is taking over, there's terrorism and all that stuff. And the people that were attracted to that, there were people your age. There were college people, there were professors, there were journalists and all these people that were on a movement. So the military decided to come in in 1970s, did I got that right yet? 1970, they come in one day and it's called the Operation Operation Condor, you know the Condor, like a bird. So they come over, take over the president, which was Isabelita Peron. They take her out, and the three forces: Air Force, uh, Army, and Navy. Um, the commanders take over the country, and they start reorganizing. So what happened is they start going, and they decide to which. You, they thought they were doing the right thing. People thought it was the right thing to happen, you know, because nobody wanted the communism and stuff. But what they did is they started to create all these clandestine prisons all over the country. And they got the martial uh, law, which means you couldn't be on the street at certain times. You couldn't be walking along. You couldn't be in groups. You had to have the confusion. Anybody, the police could stop you anytime and detain you. So they took advantage of that and they started taking all the girls, especially if you were pretty. Your parents will send you to school. You will go to get grocery and they sign you disappeared. And so what they'll do is they will get you pregnant and they will take the baby and they will kill you. And so those babies will go to military families to be raised. So over 30,000 youth were gone. No, we don't know. And they were um, tortured. And so I have kids I grew up with that they disappeared. 
I'm one of the little, the, the only, well, few in my neighborhood that survived. So when I go home, their parents are always kind of cheering and then like, oh my goodness, you, you were one of those that survived. Because mostly, and some of them, when they got kidnapped, my girlfriends from high school and all that, they will cut their faces, defigure them, they do all that stuff. So they were like, it was horrible, horrible. So anyway, so the mothers of these uh, young people, they started um, to form um, and and they're the ones that went and complained for human rights, okay? So I'm gonna make it this really quick. So, um, so it got to a point that they found out that the human rights um, were uh, you know, being protected and stuff like that. There were a lot of investigation on that. But for that reason, my parents wanted me to get me out of the country, okay? So what happened is here's more, they call the mothers of the class of the Maja. They were looking for justice until today, okay? So anyway, so what happened is, I decided, my parents said, you gotta go to the United States. I was blessed to have a sister that was a professor at BYU, uh, Brigham Young University, and she was a lot older than me. And so she helped me to get registered, and BYU said yes. So, but for me to come in, I needed to have a visa. And at that time, with all that stuff going on, the United States was not giving you visa. So I had to go to Buenos Aires, and I went with my mom, and this is very symbolic to me because uh, my grandpa, they wouldn't let her come in with me. There were thousands of people also surrounding the embassy, trying to get the kids out. And they will scan you at the, at the entrance of the door. If you didn't have all the paperwork that you needed, they wouldn't let you. So uh, they let me in and my mom was holding on to the bar. I could see her face like that because she was being squished by a lot of people. And she was telling me, and I was afraid because I never done something like that to go along. So she's like, um, I'll be right here. I'm not going to move, you know, so I could find her on the crowd to come back, you know, and we were in a big city, a city that we never been and I'm from the country, you know. So anyway, but I go in, I get the interview, they go through all of my papers, and this is what I want to tell you. I have good grades. I had no criminal records. I have all the paperwork that they wanted. And the pocket was there. I was prepared and the opportunity presented. And because I was prepared, they gave me a visa. So there were 100 kids that went in and two of us got the visa. So when I'm coming out, there's like a, a little um, kind of walk out. So I come out and in the crowd is screaming because I'm coming out and so I, I waved my visa and then it was felt like it was on a soccer game because everybody <laughs> clapped and they laughed. One kid is leaving the country. Okay. So that's how I got my visa. And that's how I ended up here. Okay. So sometimes it's not by choices, but since I was little, I always wanted to come to school here. I wanted to come, but it was super hard to leave. Super hard. So anyway, so now I needed to raise the money. Because I had a big question, okay? How do you do that? That was another barrier. So I'm sitting in front of my house, and down the street of my house, there's the the um, the military base, and another way there's the Air Force base because my dad um, had retired from the Air Force base. So I could see the soldiers that they will go from the last station that will come from the country. Actually, there were Guarani in indigenous that I wanted to do better. They live at the north of Argentina, so they will come on the bus like eight hours and bus, and then they will walk down to, to see if there could be a soldier. But when they get there, they say, hey, you have to pass a test to see if you can pass uh, to be um to be uh, to pass uh, elementary school. Okay, because these kids didn't know right, how to write or read. They were indigenous. So they were passing one of them, I kind of made a friend of one of them, because they were passing in front of my house. And so he was telling me, hey, I got it. Someone had to teach me how to write or read. And guess what? Who was really good at school and had good grades? It was me. So he said, oh, I can help you. I'll, I'll teach you and I'll get you ready. So I started and then all of a sudden, but I have a few friends that they need the same thing. So all of a sudden, I had soldiers coming into my house. I talked to my mom and they said, we had a week 
to teaching how to read, how to write, multiply, add all the elementary stuff. It, they had given me exactly what they needed to learn. And I go, oh, the week I can teach it to you. So anyway, so my mom will feed them. So we created a little business all of a sudden. And I will charge you so much money and they have to stay with us for the week. But they will go and sleep where they have, but they will come and sometimes we'll stay overnight and then they will go and test. Well, believe it or not, I did that for a year. Guess who raised the money to pay tuition? I did. So I came to United States and went to BYU. I get to BYU and guess who? I live with a family and then that family couldn't help me. I mean, I couldn't have me in there, so I became homeless. So being homeless, some of the students from BYU will help me. I figured it out where all the apple trees were up on people in the neighborhood, all the um, nut trees and stuff. And today I even could go back and drive through Provo and I find the trees and I remember. So anyway, eventually, well, eventually an American family took me under the arm. They're my parents today, they, and I bloom with them. Okay, but I have someone there. But I wanted to tell you, I went through all that. And when I got here, I couldn't talk to nobody that I had that pass. So that pass, I had to carry it. And I said, I gotta move forward. You have to get moved forward. You know what I mean? So anyway, this is what I'm telling you because barriers were there and how I overcome them. How I was just like, I don't move forward. So anyway, now I wanna tell you a little bit about my. Uh, leadership um, style, because this has a lot to do with what happened to the rest of my life. So I believe on connecting with people, having a relationship, um, and bringing everybody together with me, okay? Um, the reason why I got to places is because someone took me with, okay? So I believe like that's how you lead. Now, um, I'm going to tell you about a kayaking experience I had. There's a little analogy here. So uh, four years ago, I went to South America again to my beautiful Paraná. We have rivers and it's by the jungle. And so my uh, cousin uh, decided to um, say, let's get the nephews and nieces and now let's all go on kayaking. And I go and like, oh, that's great. I've never done it but I'm going, I'm a good swimmer. I know they're there. So anyway, so I call it, where's the leader? Because I wanted to participate in this in a little bit. So there we are, we get, those kayaks are super, super heavy. Super, super, super heavy. They're all wood and stuff. And so anyway, so we are in a river. This river, I'm gonna tell you, has piranha, has stingrays, it has quick mud. It has all the wildlife, it has alligators that we call in yacare. It has anaconda. Las anacondas, 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 which you see them. It has all type of stuff, okay? So it's not just a kayaking. And you're going on rivers that are moving the currents going a different way. And I told you this river is really wild. So anyway, so we we had some leaders. I mean, our leaders were those three guys over there sitting over there. They're going to take us on an excursion. So we're excited. We get in there. When they're loading, each of us took our own water, a little bit of the food. They say would be about three hours and then we'll come back. So anyway, I, I was sitting loading wine. And I went, why would they take wine? Because in the jungle, that's just not what you want to be drinking. You know, you want to be drinking <laughs> water. And you want to be drinking um, tea or something like that, you know? And it was humid and wet and all that. But these guys were loaded with wine. They thought, oh, we're taking some Americans and they're most given some wine. So of course we we didn't participate in that because some of us had done some stuff and we had a little bit more common sense. So anyway, but the thing is, this is my cousin and I, and we're about the same age and we're the oldies. Okay. But um, so we are taking all our nephews and nieces. So we take off. And this guy, um, there we are kayaking, we're going, and then so often we'll stop um, to use the bathroom. And then they will have us carry the canoes, cross a little island, get into somewhere else. So we were going through the obstacle and our stuff. The thing is that we went through three hours into it. And we started to get a little tired, knowing that some of them they were not very good on the canoe. 
I had two nieces that they were going from one corner of the river to the other. They just didn't get that thing. You go forward in front of you. The leader, he keep going on the front of it and said, come on, come on. And he would go so far out. And the rest of us we were back. So my friend and uh, my cousin and I, we were in the same kayak, a kayak. And we're in the middle. We're kind of watching the path. So all of a sudden, we see one of the leaders, they started puking, and then, of course, he'd been drinking all the way out, got sick. And so I said, what are we going to do with him? And so the leader says, we have to leave him there. And I'm going, I don't believe I'm leaving people behind. We're in the middle of the jungle on a river. We have to come with that. We wait and take it. Well, anyway, we waited a little bit, and I go, come on, we got to all go. And then these two girls, my teachers, they keep going doing this. And it was a disaster. It was slowing everybody out. But then I have my other, um, let me see. I have, let me see some pictures. This is all, a little bit more. But I have, um, over there, that's my daughter and her husband. Well, her husband, it's been a hunter, he's a hunter, and he was a wildlife biologist. So the two of them, they just took off. They didn't need help or nothing. They were in the environment. They're just like doing great. And so anyway, so, um, and this is my niece. Yeah, she, I don't know what my brother did to raise her, but that girl couldn't even paddle, she couldn't have direction. She was like, you have to carry it. And this is just to remind you a little bit on the business, when you're in the business, you'll have employees that you have to carry them all the way, okay? You have people that they're, they just take off when they could be on their own and they add a lot of things to it. And then you have those that are going in six acts like that and you don't know where they're going. You know, you keep just, at the end, we end up separating my cousin and I, and we took one of each, and then we were fine. But what happened? The leader keep going. He keep, once in a while, he show up and he said, why are you guys so slow? You got to keep going, going. So anyway, we get to a landing area, and this was right here, landing area to rest a little bit. And um, I said to him, you know what? It's time for us to turn around. And I said, because we already been on the water for three hours, and I go and we have three hours to come back, it's gonna be the night. What happened after six o'clock in the jungle? All the creatures go out to eat. <laughs> I don't know if it's dinner. And so, and so <laughs> when all my nephews and nieces listen to that, they go all the time, oh yeah, 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 we gotta turn around, you have to do. So the guy was upset because he said, no, we wanna, they go, no, we're turning around. So in that moment, I became a leader when I was no part of being another leader because we have some, but I have to. Because, and so I turn around, we turn around, we come back. Three hours later, we make it. There we are. There's no way to leave without connecting with another being. Okay, and I'll tell you about it. What was the difference between me and the leader that we hired, the guy that took us there? What do you think it was the difference? There was one thing, you know, yes. Oh, sorry, I didn't mean to run. Okay, there, there was one thing. I knew all my nephews and nieces. I had a relationship with them, and I was watching for them, for their safety. The leader was like, he had a goal. He was going to take us to a place that he knew, and he was going to bring it back at some time. But he never stopped to think about everything else. He never stopped to think what was the capability of each person going with. You know, who could swing? Who could, you know, or who needed more water than other people? Or like my sweet niece that couldn't even row. Where I'm going like right, left, and she was on left and the right. No, right, left, right, left. And she was on opposite or two right. And I'm going like, do you listen to me? Right, left, right, left. And I'm going, so it was just so ridiculous. But anyway, those things happen in business. So just to tell you a little bit, now you understand that um, knowing when to shift to the front, to the side, to the middle, to the back, the character uh, is a characteristic of effective leadership. Or say, sometimes a leader has to move around, and you know, and you have to know the people. Okay. So knowing that these things about me, I'm gonna go forward. Okay. So for um, I'm sorry, for about twenty years, I work as a social worker. So G. 15 minutes. Ooh. Okay, I'm going to be sweating quick. Here, so I work as a social worker. Working as a social worker, um, I got to use my skill of the leadership. Um, these families, a lot of these people, 
Um, that this is my last assignment because I used to get different assignment. I worked for a merit for, for a while. And it was to work with the family of the gangs, um, youth in the state of Utah. They found out that 43% of the Latino youth, they were, by the time they were 21, they were in jail over there. So I was asked to come and develop a program um, to help them to get them out of the criminal system. So yeah, we did, and I got a few of them. So I'm gonna tell you really quick, the story is some of them. So this is a story, I wanted to do yeah, the story of that. Okay, Jose, the story of Jose, I'm gonna tell you really quick, so cute. So um, Jose was completely involved in gangs and actually had those pictures, that's how he used to come. He used to come so wasted, I thought, oh, and the next time he comes, he's dead. There was this family, the whole family had to be on the program, and they had to come two to three times a week to our program, and we did a lot of stuff. That would be another discussion. But anyway, Jose, I thought, you know, when you're a social worker, you help all these people, and you don't get to see them anymore. But about a year ago, Jose's mom called me, and she needed a letter from me to, for immigration. Because Jose had graduated from University of Utah as an accountant, and he was applying for citizenship, and they needed my recommendation and my pictures. I didn't post his pictures. I did documented all these program stuff. So Jose, I was in tears because you never get to see that. And so, and the mom said, and and their parents they were supposed to be one year in the program. They stayed two. And that's how we get. So that's the story about Jose, and I could tell more. So let me tell. Oh, let me tell you about the story about Juan. Juan was a brother of one of the kids who were cut, but you know, I needed to work with the whole family. He will, he will come to the program, and I know. I mean, he had beautiful tattoo, but it was intimidating. He always been tough, and I didn't know he would come. And if he if he disagreed with me, he was gonna come after me. You know what I mean? But Juan also went through the program and and try to overcome and learn things so one day i take him this is non-profit okay we don't have money so i wanted to take him kite flying and so we went to sugar park and i'm going i don't have kites so i went to the dollar store and i bought about 15 kites i could afford 15 dollars so i bought this kite and i was in here when i saw juan chasing his kite <laughs> all over <laughs> I knew that was the beginning of a change. Okay. So anyway, so then, oh, Pablo. So my husband and I, we went to the restaurant, we're eating, and the service keeps bringing us food. And and I go, and hey, and he said, the chef wants you to try this appetizer. I go, oh, that's kind of nice. So we turn in there on the sun. He shows up again and brings another plate. And I go, and like, the chef wants you to try this plate. And my husband said, okay, something's wrong. The third time he comes in, he says, who is this? And I'm going, so I turn to the server and say, who's the chef? And so on the back of the kitchen, I could see, he says, and he called me Maria. Maria, this is, this, this is Pablo, I'm a chef. <laughs> and he was so proud that he saw me come into the restaurant. He wanted to show me again. He went through all that changing. He overcome all of those barriers, which is economy, being an illegal immigrant, uh, growing up on crime and all that stuff. And he made something of himself. So anyway, so uh, this is Miguel. Miguel showed up to my water store, dressed up as a police officer, and he took a minute to recognize him. Actually, this is not him. He's a lot more handsome. <laughs> and he showed up and I did him recognizing and he came to give me a hug to show me that he was a police officer. That from being a little gangster. <laughs> I to talk to the judge to give him an opportunity because that was, I will speak for them, advocate for them in front of the court to get them out of the system. That was the goal. So begging for all these kids, and there were some, some were some students harder than others. But anyway, so anyway, one thing that everything have in common, and I did, as I tell you my story and all that, is to have a growth mindset. Okay, to have a growth mindset, to have an abundance mindset. Um, so I'll pass really fast for this. You probably know this from school, some of you. But I'm going to tell you a quick story about 
two brothers that wanted to eat the mom who made cake and they wanted to eat the last two pieces. So they're fighting who gave me the bigger, the biggest piece. So anyway, uh, these two brothers have what's called, it's a scar scarcity, scarcity, scarcity. Yeah, mindset. Because they're thinking, if I eat the big one, you, you get less, okay? But it could have been a different way. You could have think that um, on a growth mindset or abundance, you could think, hey, there's flour, there's eggs, there's, I have a beater, I can make more cake. That's how that person will think. And I can, not only that, I can have different recipes, I can have different type of cake. That's how you need to think. Okay, so anyway, so that's, I preach that. I preach overcoming barriers. And I'm gonna tell you something about racism. So anyway, um, and discrimination. Did I have been discriminated all my life here? Yeah, I have experience. But did I became an, an um, obstacle for me to move forward or for me to use it as excuse? No, I absolutely reject to use my background, being Latina, speaking with the accent, um, maybe not having the best clothes or not having uh, the the best support that some of some of you might be blessed with and all that stuff. So I didn't never let it be a barrier. I refuse to use that discrimination. It would be a barrier for me. You know what it was? It was like, I learned to upset people have the right to think whatever they want to, but they're not going to touch me. Okay, I'll move forward. So anyway, so I'm going to, this is the, I was going to tell you about, sort of, but anyway, we'll skip in. I want to finish because I want to have you an opportunity to ask questions. So did you know that the only bird in the world that dares to sting the eagle is the, is it crow? I said it right. She was correcting me coming in. Mom, mm -hmm. So what happened? Croc. So what happened is the croc gets on the back of the eagle. Now, and it starts picking the neck. Pick, pick, pick the neck to the point that they think they're going to kill it that way. But the eagle doesn't care. He keeps flying. Flying high, 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 high. He flies so high to get to the point that the croc can, doesn't have enough oxygen to breathe. And so then he drops and flies down to his bed. Okay? So, <laughs> ah, yes, it does. It does. It falls from the sky. And the eagle didn't do nothing. The only thing he did is to keep flying. So my thought, my final thought is uh, don't let the croc get to you. Oh. Fly high. <laughs> Try as high as you can. Uh, they will drop by yourself, okay? And these, the cards can represent any insecurities you can have, any obstacles you can have. So if I have a message to leave you with is prepare yourself, prepare yourself, uh, mm -hmm. work hard, uh, study, 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 education. You don't know how important it is. Why did I always come forward, I always were able to preach on my, my goals and stuff is because I always was prepared. When the opportunity came, I was there, ready to take it and fly with it. And I didn't let others, I, I overcome. I did have obstacles. I did have that experience. And you can tell where I came from, you know, all the stuff. But I think I, for some reason, I always had that open mind. I wanted to be better. I wanted to be sound. And I'm going to tell you, and I'm going to end with that. My translation business, I didn't start it until about 10 years ago. The reason why I started is I used to translate all the time. And I had all my certifications, you know, but to translate medical uh, through the court. I had done all the classes at University of Utah and then all that stuff. And again, I was prepared, no? So what happened is they lay, the company I was working with, it was the biggest company we translate with. And they decided not to hire people anymore, um, that they were going to go with the big companies, national company. So we all lost our employment. So I thought, hey, what's wrong if I become a company? I should have the, my equal opportunity. 
And so I went to my son, who was an attorney. He helped me like in two hours, put it back in my LLC. I did a pay, I went to the bank, opened an account, blah, blah, blah. In a day, I had my pocket. I ran to the company and I said, I want to have the opportunity, like the national um, people and the national um, organizations, I mean, these um, businesses. And they, they couldn't decline me. So they took it. So the next day, they call me and they say, and hey, we decided we're going to have you do the leftovers kind of thing. You do good on art and this a little. So it was a little thing. But then to then I'm going like, OK, I'm going to get better at this. I'm going to turn them around overnight so that there's not going to be people who are competing. I knew those national company will take about a week. So I started turning overnight, all those hard work overnight, overnight. So this, all of a sudden, they need, they, the company say, hey, we look good when we can turn in stuff fast. So they will give me more work and more work. And then guess who took over? All of that, it was me. So my company took over. And I'm right now the company that does stuff for the state, stuff for the court. And because I'm in that position, I can still advocate for my, for my Latinos and minority and the refugee. I get emotional. Mm -hmm. But you know, that was my it been my passion, you know? So how I was helped, I've been able to help because I put myself in a good situation because I was prepared. So here you go, be prepared. So when the opportunity comes, you'll be ready to grab up. And that's it. It's a pleasure. <laughs> Oh, I wanted to show you something at the end. I have, this is my family, oh, oh, me familia. Oh, did I kill it? <laughs> there it is. This is my familia. And I'm going to tell you, my kids have PhD. My little one has a master's degree. And she says, don't, don't expect me to do <laughs> and, and PhD, but she has three little kids. Even my in-laws, uh, we put them through school. So anyway, we... We value education. That's what I tell you. Thank you. Does anyone have any questions? Yeah. Might be a little bit unrelated, but do you have like a, a website? Because I was trying to do research on you, but I, I, I couldn't. No, no, because uh, you said for like a, a superior translation? Yeah, I, I couldn't find anything about it. Oh, I do have a little website. I don't run it very much because I haven't had any, but I don't know if you find it. I do have a, a little website in there, and uh, but I haven't had the need for it. Work comes every day through my computer. I just do it, and I I have to tell you, I get paid really well. So yeah, yeah, it's nice. It's nice. No, it's really nice. We I'm, I've been able to take my family and fun trips and been able to do wonderful things for my grandkids. I have I have grandma scholarships, so if my kids want to do something, they can have money. So there's a lot of things I can do. Money does give you a uh, I say it gives you a, a nice lifestyle, you know what I mean? But I work really hard for it. <laughs> and I came a long way. So I don't know if you have any other questions. Hopefully there's Oh, so your company, you made it in like a day, and yep. then the next day you turned it in, and so you get paid by the government to just translate documents? Yes. Or what do you guys translate? Well, no, and I get, well, this is what happened. I started working for this one organization, and I cannot give the name because I, I have loyalty to keep okay. that information. I cannot share the information with this company, but I got to tell you, they're one of the biggest uh company that need has a need for material to be translated okay these materials go to schools i do the medicals i do for the court i do for the state of utah i do for the i can say the asian association um so so what happened is i started with one and then that company said oh you gotta go with her because she's really good and so I picked up another organization and then the other one said, hey, you know what? She does really good. She turns the work over night. So I picked up another one. And then I went, you know, the driver's license, you want to go and get your driver's license. You have to show them your birth certificate. Well, if you are an immigrant, you have to have all those documents done in, in English, but the, the state wants only certain people to do it. So I went through them and because I have a certification with the Supreme Court, I turned in that and they picked me. So who does 
all those translations, it's me. So I got people bringing me their birth certificate and, and I had done so many court papers. I got really good, especially birth certificates from different countries that have come. Um, I've gotten really good at, at telling if they're, um, they're not fake or something like that. So they can report and so I grew with it. That's what I'm saying. It just, I mean, that opened my door. You know what I mean? It got me in. But then me turning in the work on time and taking whatever was coming and tell you sometimes I even didn't know how to open the document. Now we're doing Canvas. It's so hard to do translation Canvas because all these artwork, everything moves around, takes you a long time. But my creativity, uh, I get to use it. So anyway, I can do flyers and the like I just finished a huge project for the court uh, with some people. There were over a hundred um over a hundred um testimonies from people that have been uh, used as a trafficking, you know, the traffic people. Yeah, that's another story. So I was I was able to translate all the testimonies to present to the court. So that's why I'm telling you all of a sudden, I'm still doing social work. And uh, yeah. How many languages do you speak? To tell the truth, at home growing up, um, my grandparents lived with that, they were Italian. So it was Italian at home. So I was speaking Spanish, Italian was in the home. Then when I went to elementary school, the government chooses what languages you're gonna learn. Mm -hmm. So they pick French. So I learned French until I got, I finished middle school. And then when it got to middle school, they let me switch to three years in English. So, well, the last two years, I did 11 and 12th grade, I did English. And then um, because I live very close to Brazil, we get the influence of uh, the Portuguese, Fala Portuguesa, no, French. No. <laughs> okay. So, but what, you know, what was that last? Parla <laughs> l'italiano. Oh, vale. Oh, parla l'italiano. <laughs> but anyway, yeah. So, um, but as you see, I've been here in the country for 40 years. I still speak with an accent and I'm still learning English. English is hard. It's hard. English is really hard. And the reason why I have an accent is because I learned English as an adult. If I would have been here until about age 12, 13, the English learning a new language, you don't get an accent. Ah, there it is. But if you learn it later on in your life, you will have an accent. Any other questions? Yeah. Do you see a lot of fake like, documents and birth certificates? <laughs> uh, <laughs> twice. Okay. Twice. Okay. Yes. Twice. Yeah. I mean, um, I had two experiences where I got a document and I'm going, oh, this doesn't look good. And so what I do is I research, I go to the country where they're coming from and I look at their archive and how the birth certificates are supposed to look like. So you have to research. And then I'm going like, oh, this is not good. And then the dates are not matching to what the person looks like. And you're going like, ah. so <laughs> my job, my job is to translate. So I translate, but then I write a little document of what I think and I give it to them. They make, they decide. I know they are too. I, I get paid to translate. But I guess a couple of times. But that was it. That was it. The rest of the time, it's incredible the stories of the people um, that they're trying to, they're coming in and anyway, well, but I, my heart is with the immigrants, the immigrant, so. One more question. Yes. Oh, um, I was curious, do you like hire anyone or do you just like do this in your house? I do have people that works with me, but I'm gonna, um, I'm gonna tell you, here we come, preparation. People works with me, um, I have my sister, she has a PhD. Um, my team, they're all hired, very high educated people because I do I do work that goes to court because publish and websites. I mean, I just can't know how like, oh, I, I went to, I, I live in the country for a little bit and I go there, or at home we speak Spanish, but you didn't get a degree or don't have that. So I, 
I really look, I have four people that I consult or they help me when I have a lot of work. And so what we do is one person translate, another person does editing. And we do books. We had done book. I had done a few books. Yeah, too. We translated book. It's funny because I translated a book and the writer put it back in English and he liked the version in English better after the translating of that. He, because Spanish, we express more, we have more words to say. And I just kind of enhance it a little bit because I wanted the Spanish to look back in a Spanish book. And so he translated it back and he said, I like it better. So he went and changed the English version. So just, just a little thing on the side, just kind of cool. Any other question? I know it's time to close. We've got one more question. So what are you getting out of this? What do you, how, what do you think? What you learned from me today? I would like, I'll make any questions. Have you learned today? Yeah, one hell of a spirit. <laughs> Thank you. I'll give you some of it. <laughs>